Welcome to Presence, a global conversation for a new earth, with hosts Doug King and Cody Dees. Thanks. Welcome. Here we are, headed a little bit closer to spring as we rock and roll down the road here, and I'm with my friend and partner, Mr. Cody Dees. Hey, Cody. How are you? Fantastic. How are our listeners? Yeah. How are you guys? <laughs> Silence. I was like listening to see if anyone's there. Um, there are people there. They are listening. We're getting your feedback, and we're so grateful for that. Keep it coming. Okay, um, Doug, let's get into this. Um, we're talking about faith. This is uh, part five. Yeah. Last week, we jumped into Galatians. Yep. Um, we talked a little bit about the context. I want to bring that context back up briefly because we're going to jump back into Galatians 2. You made some promises on the last episode as well that we got to get to. I will. Do you have a list of those? I'm ready. Okay, so we'll get to those, and then we need to, yeah. So that's let's jump in. Galatians, uh, today I want to do Galatians 2. Now, uh, let me read this. I'll read uh, Galatians 2, verse 16, and then uh, let's give a brief uh, version of context a little bit to our people so they know. So Absolutely. This is Galatians 2, verse 16. Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith. Okay, now I'm going to read it as my translation <laughs> says it. But by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Boom. There it is. There Paul it is. said it. Yeah. New inspired version translation. Yeah. Yes. So, so how do you get around that, right? <laughs> well, let's so, do this. How about you set, let's, for those that didn't listen to the last podcast, yeah. little context, Paul is writing to the Galatians. Yes. About the Judaizers. Yes, because Paul has outlined that there are two different covenants which are ways of defining the way God relationship works. Covenant number one defines God relationship in terms of the one who does these things will live by them. That's a quote from the Torah. And what Paul is saying is it's purely upon your obedience, your fulfilling of the covenant completely through yourself. And then, of course, there's the second covenant, which God is the source of that covenant. He swears an oath not by anyone else, but by himself, because there's none greater, says the Hebrew writer. So you have the two covenants. So within that, you have two different ways of understanding the source of salvation, which is really what Paul's getting at. And it's a two-edged sword. We're going to talk about the other edge of that sword as we move along in this podcast. But the first thing he was identifying for the Galatians was that you cannot, through works of the law, come before God and declare your God identity by your doing. So that's the context of it. Now, as you study Galatians 2 and many other of the books in the Bible, the one thing you understand is that the context of the language in which it was written, the Koine Greek, is that which determines the way that you interpret some of these sentences and phrases, and that can be extremely important. So there's a guy named Richard B. Hayes who wrote uh, 30 plus years ago an article pointing out that when you read Galatians 2, there are two genitives in there. And I'm not going to go into English class because number one, Cody, I hated English. I'm sorry to all the teachers out there that teach it. But as a subject in school, I did not like English. You know, what's interesting about that is the one, and I use this term lightly, I just, I wish I had paid attention a little bit more in English yeah. because yeah. it has been quite useful for yes. my world right now. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So, he pointed out, Richard uh, Hayes pointed out that there are two genitive forms. Now, a genitive is when you are showing the source of something. So I, if you're talking about my car, you're talking about the car of Doug. My house would be the house of Doug. And what Hayes is pointing out is that when you read Galatians 2, 16, Cody, that actually the acknowledgement of the genitive would read like this. 
Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, that would apply, as we have seen from Paul in this letter, to the first covenant, rather, but by faith of Christ. Not in Christ, but by faith of Christ. Even we have believed, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by works of the law. For for by works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. What Paul is saying in Galatians, what he's going to say in Romans when we get to Romans later this year, is that there is only one faith that saves, and that's the faith of Christ. And the faith of Christ was that he could allow the self to be put to death, lie completely helpless in a grave, and then be saved purely only by the power of God, the God of resurrection. And so, the only saving faith there ever was, was a faith 2,000 years ago. And what they were to do was to be imitators of Christ. Paul says this in other places. Well, what are you doing when you're imitating Christ? You're imitating his faith. And what is that faith? His, the faith is, is that God raises the dead. Who are the dead? Well, Paul says in Romans, all in Adam are the dead. Well, wait a minute. Well, what do you mean resurrects the dead? Don't you mean he just resurrects some of the dead? Uh, No, God is the God of deliverance for all that are dead. And here's the point that we're going to get to just to set this whole conversation up, Cody. For 2,000 years, Christianity has made faith another self as source requirement. And what we have said in the religion, making Jesus a religion called Christianity, is that faith is that which determines whether you're saved or not. Not not God and the deliverer coming from Zion or God bringing a new covenant, because God was the source of that. Uh, Rather, it is instead whether or not I have faith. Now, there's 30,000 plus denominations. So even after I say I have, it's by faith I'm saved, then you and I are going to get in an argument about what's true faith and whether you still have faith and whether you lost your faith or whether it was a good faith to begin with and blah, 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 blah. But you can see how we're right away changing the entire context that faith is that which points away from the self to that which is the source of salvation, and that is God and God alone. And that's a, we've, we have, it's repetitive. We have been saying that over and over throughout this entire faith series is the distinction between God as source and self as source. Now, I want to go back to something you just said, because you're not like, you can't just, you can't just say, make statements and then just run off. (laughs) So come back to the mic. Uh, You just made a distinction between the faith of Christ and faith in Christ. Yes. Okay. Now that can be confusing to a lot of people. Okay. Let's delineate some Um, more then. What is the difference between the two? And uh, aren't there places where Paul does say, place your faith in Christ? Yeah, he says it right here in 2.16. He says, uh, they're not justified by works of the law. That's one way which comes through humans, rather by faith of Christ. That is coming through God as source. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That's God as source. Then he says, even we have believed in Christ. Jesus Christ. So what Paul is saying is, yes, we believe in the faith of Christ. It is not our faith, but the but what we believe in when he says you believe in Christ, what they're believing in is the faith of Christ. That's mm. what they were believing in. Okay. So there's a distinction there between believing in Jesus and then believing in the faith of Jesus. And for Paul, it's the same thing. Okay. To believe in Jesus is to believe in the faith of Jesus. And this is why Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 makes it so clear that the whole resurrection of the dead is purely solely around the event of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the event that brings about salvation. And so if we're going to make faith a requirement, we have to remember that Paul is going to say in Romans 8, if you want to talk about requirements of justification by requirements, you're talking about the law because that's what law does. It, it makes a requirement of you. And how many people, I mean, Christianity is centered around the requirement that you have faith. And that's going to be 
a problem. There's a couple of verses I'd like to read here in addition to this that show that this is a real problem for Paul. Uh, so, for yeah. example, Go did ahead. you have a question before I left that? I and mean, keep Doug, going? I've, my, got, million, I've got, you? I, yes, I've got tons of questions. You're becoming no, a problem. I was just going to add the uh, Ephesians 2.8 uh, just briefly. Okay. For it is yeah. by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work so that no one would boast. That was like a classic verse. My first year fundamentalist blue meme church world taught me to memorize early on. Yes. So a lot of this conversation, Doug, they would thoroughly say, right on, not of works. The, the part where I feel like you're taking the step out is you're also subscribing this to their very own religion, which lots of them can't see, including no. myself at right, times, right. where it is nothing but a uh, carbon copy of Judaism. So exactly right. And so let's look at that. That's actually Ephesians 2.8 that you just quoted. Mm -hmm. for, for by grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of your self. You've been saved by grace through faith and that not of yourself. Well, wait a minute. If it's not from me, what, where, where's that faith from? It is the gift of God. What is the gift of God? I could read numerous passages where Jesus Christ is enumerated or or given the the label of the gift of God. Uh, the, the sacrifice of Christ is God's gift. The gift of God is the faith of Christ. And that's why you've been saved through faith. You've been saved through the faith of Christ. And that's not of you. And here's what he's saying to make his point. Lest anyone should boast. Now, see, when I was in my 20s, what I used to think was, yeah, I've been saved. Most of these people here in the neighborhood haven't. Most of the people in my city haven't. But I don't want to brag about it. You know, I've been saved. They haven't been. I really shouldn't boast about it. Mm -hmm. That's not yeah. what he's saying. Right, 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 right. What, what Paul is saying is that if you make your faith something that determined your salvation, you have just entered into boasting, and that is Christian privilege. Now, here's, here's a point I would make about the boasting. Paul mentions in Romans 11, mm -hmm. do not boast. He also says, don't be wise in your own opinion. And he's speaking of the, the opinion they held of themselves versus unbelieving Israel, that because they were believers, that God's deliverance only applied to them. Stop, now, God, now let me just finish this one point, Dang and then it, you can hold, hold your question. <laughs> Quit drinking your tea. Uh, uh, put that tea down. And Carol, so it's every podcast. Now, and people. so here's here's the biggie. There are two sides to the selfish source problem that we've inherited with this great, great narrative. Number one, in the narrative, we began by telling people through Genesis that all human beings were depraved and the depravity of man was one side of the coin, the depravity of man. That's one side of the coin that has to do with the self and our and what we do is what determines our identity. That's one. But the other side of that coin is arrogance and boasting. Because that self is source claiming I, through my faith, have established salvation. Now, I can sit back and say, oh, no, but I don't do it. I don't do it. God does it. Well, when does God do it? Well, he does it when I have faith. So at the end of the day, we're trying to say it's not a work, but in fact, it is a work. It is a requirement that we have put on all other human beings. And so boasting is causing us to look at ourselves in the religion of Christianity versus everybody else, whether they're an atheist, a Buddhist, a Hindu, or whatever. And that's where Christian privilege comes in, because what you are saying is, is that my identity has been determined by my faith. And I'm saying that my faith points away from me, and I am thankful to God every day that it is God who has saved and delivered all into a new heaven and earth. It is God who defeated sin and death, and that's for everybody. He didn't de defeat sin and death just for the select few that do certain things. That's law. So when I get into this discussion, Cody, 
and this idea of boasting and privilege and being wise in your own opinion. I see that as the exact other side of saying, or we are totally depraved through self as source. And those are the two egoic sides of the coin that we've been fed for these years because in the evolutionary process, human beings start there understanding through self as source, but the evolution process is to reveal over centuries what it did reveal, and that is that God alone is the source of salvation, and my faith points to that. But my faith is not that which itself determines the salvation that comes through God. Okay, let's talk about uh, yeah. got a list of things. Superiority. Yep. I want to talk about superiority for a minute. Yep. And I want to talk about, uh, first of all, my experience <clears throat> is when you talk about faith, faith initially was, are you in the right group? So let me start there. Um, and the right group was not just Christianity, but a particular type of Christianity. Now, if you subscribe to Jesus or you put your belief in Jesus, or as Paul says, uh, your faith is in Christ, they would say, okay, you're good. All right. Now, this is, we're talking first tier blue meme, the world I came out of. Um, however, it was, that's where it started. Are you in the right group? And then after the conversation of which group you're in, which that's what salvation was. I was in the wrong group. I get saved. Now I'm in the right group. Then after you're in the right group, the conversation was about morality. Okay. Which is also, you could interpret that as the law. And they had to be careful with these generalizations because sometimes I think we take things from the Torah and the Old Testament and we move them over and we so oversimplify it that we don't nuance it enough and it becomes just terrible. So, uh, but it became about morality at that point. And at this point in the conversation, they would say, right on, Doug, totally with you, faith in Christ. It is not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. You don't do anything. Now, bow your head, close your eyes, recite this prayer after me and come forward. Okay, they would still say, yeah, we're not saying you do anything in that sense. Um, you just need to confess Jesus Christ as Lord, all right? Yep. As Paul says, confess with your mouth, mm -hmm. believe in your heart, you will be saved. Yes. However, if your life didn't reflect the boundaries, <laughs> the boundaries that they have set forth yes. of what that particular life should look like. Yes. Now, they would not say how you live your works or your actions or no. keeping of the law saved mm -hmm. you. But they would say, you can determine whether or not you were saved yes. based on if you have kept the law. And if you do not keep the law, uh, a.k.a. you have an affair on your wife, right? Um, there's a good chance you never really got saved to begin with. Yes. And, and of course, grace does cover some sins that are minor sins. Like if I lie to people or I know I cheated on my income taxes or whatever, grace covers that. But if I do a big sin, then I'm in peril because what, what we're actually saying then is that, well, you didn't really have faith to begin with. This is someday when we talk about Calvinism and Arminianism, it's, it's hysterical to me because it's just two different ways of saying the same thing. Either you're going to look at a person's life and say, well, obviously you weren't predestined because you did go off and do these heinous things. So you claimed you were predestined, but you really weren't. Or through Arminianism, we say, well, yeah, you chose to go off and do these things. So that's how we know you're lost. At the end of the day, Christianity makes sure that the message is, is that some 70 percent of God's children are lost because they're not part of Christianity. And this is deeper than uh, Martin Luther and the Reformation. Much, <laughs> now, much has, so. We're now, evolving has beyond that. It has hints of it. It does. Well, uh, it, of, it transcends of the selling of indulgences. Yes. And yeah, so, 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 and this is what's interesting about it, is you see that common thread all throughout history from the Torah moving forward. And this is what you see. But what I find fascinating is a lot of modern day Christianity right now uh, looks more like the Judaizers than what Paul is teaching in this moment. Yes. And and we don't. And so we're we're this is what presence is doing. We're we're raising a red flag here and we're asking, wait a minute, all these problems that we're having in the world with discrimination, segregation, privilege, separation. Are we able to turn that 
lens on ourselves? Are we able to look at ourselves and ask, in what ways are we separating? In what ways are we discriminating? And so on and so forth. And and that's the key, I think, to understanding the promises of God is that he finds all under disobedience that he might have mercy upon all. I want to talk about, uh, in the time we have left, yeah, yeah. Uh, the seeds of Abraham. Yes, yes. Genealogy. That's good. That's good. And good. Uh, now that said, uh, that goes back to privilege, and that's why we're not kind of land the plane. Um, now, I want to talk about superiority, boasting, arrogance, um, because think about, uh, again, as we mentioned last week, a modern day kind of fresh out of seminary interpretation tends to be very anti-Semitic when you read things about Judaism. But we have to keep in mind, we're not talking about Jews as a collective people. We're talking about a particular Jewish people at a particular time, these Judaizers who uh, wanted to add the keeping of the law to what, what Paul was saying. It's not even that, as I understand it, and you can help me here, but that they were opposed to Paul's teaching as much as they were like, it's Paul's teaching plus this. And it came down to an issue of race, actually, in some form or fashion, which was God has always worked through the Jewish people. These are his people. It's very clear in the Torah. And so we're cool with you Gentiles jumping in because we're believing Jews. However, you need to be a part of this particular race, a part of this people. And here's how you do that. Circumcision, observance of the law, on and on the list goes. Food, dietary restrictions. Now, that said, again, (laughs) I, it's like as clear as I can see it. We have taken this and we generalized it and made it so first here that we said, okay, Sarah and Hagar, Sarah is Judaism. Now listen to this interpretation. This is a, and Christianity is Sarah, right? Yeah. So Christianity is the freedom, the free woman yes. and in the law and legalism. And therein you have two world religions. Yes. And that is not at all what Paul is talking no. about. Paul's talking about the deliverance from religion because religion is absolutely requiring self as source. I've used this example before. You will never go into the waiting room of a hospital and have the nurse run out and proclaim it's a Christian. <laughs> and the reason... And, I don't know. I'm pretty sure if it would ever happen, it was me that that would happen to. <laughs> yeah, it could have been your family, Cody. There are always exceptions. It's a Christian. No, yes. and in your family, they would have said no because Cody has to reach the age of accountability, whereby Cody makes a decision whereby Cody makes a confession GP. whereby Cody says these magic words, Good whatever point. they are. And here's the thing about every single Christian will say, yeah, it's faith and it's God doesn't know it. My faith doesn't have anything to do with it. And yet, if that's the case, somebody please explain to me then why there are 30,000 denominations. What's the division over? Why divide? The reason there's 30,000 denominations is because every one of them has different requirements, just like the law had requirements. And they're all determined by man-made groups who have determined what makes proper faith and what doesn't make proper faith, what makes proper ecclesiology and what doesn't, what makes proper use of women and doesn't make possible proper use of women. I could go on and on on a rant with all this. So that that's the, the big point that I would make about this. Okay. Uh, John 8, let me read two verses. Okay. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. And this is the famous line. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Okay. They answered him, the believing Jews, we are Abraham's descendants. Boom. There it is. Okay. And have never been slaves of anyone How can you say that we shall be set free? Now we're talking about genealogy. Now we're talking about the line of Abraham. Yes. Okay. And you had talked about seed singular. Okay. Can you talk about that for just a minute? Yeah. So when we're looking at Paul's whole thing in Galatians 4, it's predicated or it's the result rather of that which he talked about in in chapter 3. And that was the concept of uh, the promise was made to Abraham and his seed and, and Paul makes the point that's seed singular, not plural. Paul will go on to describe 
the seeds of many apply to that which comes through Hagar, meaning that which comes through Jacob and Israel. They're the seeds of many, all the genealogy of the tribes and all of the myriad of birthings that happen through there. That's the seeds of many. And God's promise was not carried through seeds of many because that's self is source. Who births children genealogically? Humans do by their own power. By, through their own relationships. However, Paul makes it clear in Galatians 3 that in Isaac will your seed be called. Isaac was the seed, singular, that was a foreshadowing of Jesus, the seed, singular. Jesus is the singular seed related to salvation and related to faith. Everything else is an imitation thereof. And so you have in Isaac this seed. Why Isaac? Because Isaac was brought forth from the deadness of Sarah's womb. Isaac is a resurrection archetype. What about Jesus? Jesus is brought forth from the deadness of the tomb. In both cases, who was the source of that? Was, Was it Abraham? No. Was it Jesus? No. It was God in every case. And this is what Paul is trying to explain to the Galatians. When you add requirements to anything related to either faith and or salvation, then you have just taken into your hands the definition of what's required by a human being in order to have appropriate, proper, good God relationship so that you are accepted. Otherwise, you are not accepted of God. And now we have set up a 2000 year uh, paradigm where it is up to us as good, faithful Christians to go out into the world, which we don't. I only know of one denomination that ever knocks on my door. But most people will talk about the importance of this salvation on Sunday. And I did, too. But Hardly anybody in my neighborhood knew I believed that because I didn't make it a point to go through my neighborhood and proclaim the thing that I'm telling everybody is so blasted important that I want to get into a big argument over it. I did because they guilt and shamed us so much that I had to. Yeah. 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 Now, did you do it in the grocery store? Oh, yeah. I actually used to take gospel tracks and I'd put them inside egg cartons. No, I'm talking about talking to people directly. Stop. Oh, Oh, br- totally. Okay. Oh, yeah. I had, uh, I'm glad but, that, I but didn't it was go. all, it was all, again, uh, yeah. to our point. Yeah. This was how you knew you were in the faith of Christ. Yeah. I'm just yeah. saying a lot of people don't. Oh, totally. Yeah. But I, I think you're, well, I was you're one of the few. I was a yeah. good Christian. Exactly. <laughs> As opposed to a bad one. Okay. Exactly. No, I want to say a, yeah. a point here yeah. in our closing. We got like two minutes left. Oh, okay. Um, this lineage from Abraham, this genealogy. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is what the Judaizers were. That, again, it goes back to that superiority. Now, we're not talking about all Jews. Remember, we're talking about a specific group of Jewish people, the Judaizers, were God's chosen people. And first-tier interpretation, you just gave an integral perspective. First-tier interpretation literalizes this conversation, and they're just like the Judaizers. So Gentiles, you need to become like us. Okay? So we love your message. We think it's great, Paul. Fantastic. But thank God for Peter over here who's leading us forward. And you guys need to do that. But honestly, you need to be a part because we are the chosen people. It's pretty clear we're the chosen people. So here's what happens. <laughs> and talk to me about the history of this because this is mind blowing. Okay. First year interpretation, you then begin to interpret it as Israel, this group of people, are still God's chosen people. So we are to protect them as a nation, even if they do atrocities, because. This is our interpretation of the scripture because they're God's chosen people. But guess what we believe at our core? Now we have a new religion. It's called Christianity. And this is where we point to Christian privilege because we are now superior to Islam. We are now superior to any other world religion out there because we are also in Christ. And just as they trace their lineage through Abraham, we trace ours through Christ. And that's our winning point. And we believe we're superior. And that's called Christian privilege. And that's how you turn Christ into a form instead of experiencing Christ as transform. And that goes back to a Venn diagram we've used on many occasions. We need to probably parse that out a bit more, too. But we're at the end of this podcast. But those are all great points you're making. And again, for anything that you're hearing here and you're thinking, wait a minute, though, what about this? What about that? 
just keep shooting those emails to us. We're doing our best to get to them. And uh, we'll see if we can't continue to parse this out. We may need a couple more episodes on faith, Cody, uh, certainly. But uh, I think we're, we're getting our point across here. Okay, awesome. Hey, that's all the time for today. Um, we'll be back next week. We're just getting fired up. Have a good week. Thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at info at presence.tv. You can also visit our website at presence.tv or find us on Facebook. We look forward to hearing from you. 